Hey, David, how's it going? Good. Yeah, thanks for having me, Pete. How are you doing? I'm hanging in there, man. I haven't seen you since Dreamforce. How's Vancouver? Good. Yeah, you know what? We've been having a fantastic fall. Usually it's absolute pouring rain. We have had a bunch lately, but I think we're in for it now. Nice. That well, that'll be good. It's like you'll get some uh some good snow going up there at Whistler for uh for you guys, right? That's where we're open. Yeah, exactly. We've had a uh, wonderful summer, but hopefully that means that all that moisture in the air is gonna come back as snow. I love it. Excellent. Do you um uh do, do you guys get up much on the uh on the slopes up there? You yeah, you know what? This is the first year that we've actually invested in doing a full season pass up at Whistler. So our kids are getting a little mm -hmm. older now. And last year they did really well. So we uh decided to go for it. So we'll be probably doing that commute up uh, the Cedar Sky Highway quite a bit this winter. I love it. Awesome. Well, we can get jamming here as, as folks join us. Um, folks, we'll just do a little bit of an intro here uh, and then we can get rolling with uh, with David. I'm really excited to talk about all manner of uh, um, sales operational excellence with uh, David, who's the CEO of Traction Complete. Um, but for folks who are joining us, welcome to Modern Sales uh, Power Hour. I'm your host. I'm Pete Kazanji. We'll give everyone a kind of a couple of minutes to join here. So while we're waiting, um, like everyone to kind of get a couple, um, take a few moments to get familiar with uh, the webinar interface here. Um, so. You know, we encourage audience participation. So if you use the, you know, please do use the chat panel, uh, the Q and A panel. Um, folks, go ahead and let us know where you're calling from. I'm com I'm I'm here in San Francisco. Obviously, David is in uh, is is in Van Vancouver. Let us know what you're most excited about learning from from David here today. Um, for those who are not familiar, Power Hour is hosted by Modern Sales Pros. Uh, MSP is the world's largest revenue leadership community for those in sales management, sales and revenue operations sales development and the related discipline. Uh, the community's mission is to create an environment for our 30,000 and growing members to answer questions that they'd struggle to solve on their own, help them see around corners they may not know about, just get better in general. And so we do that through great live sessions like what you're about to experience today um, through our online, uh, robust online forum and in-person events as well. So for those who weren't previously admitted, we're gonna go ahead and add you to the community. Uh, before we get started, just a couple of reminders, Power Hour is a unique format. Um, there's not really a specific piece of content that we're gonna be talking through. Instead, we're gonna be doing kind of Q&A with David here, um, leveraging his expertise for some questions that have been submitted ahead of time and then also questions that folks might have here. So, you know, please do ask your questions, use the chat, et cetera. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and head into some introductions here. Uh, I'll make mine pretty quick. Um, I'm Pete Kazanji. I'm one of the founders of Atrium. We make data-driven sales management software that helps sales uh, sales teams, so sales leaders, managers, and reps use metrics to improve the performance uh, performance of their teams. Um, I'm also the founder of Modern Sales Pros, and um, you know, also wrote a book on on early stage sales called Founding Sales. So that's a little bit about me, uh, David. Maybe you could introduce yourself um, to to the audience here and let them know what you kind of spend your time on at uh, Attraction Complete. Before that, Attraction on Demand, and like maybe before that. Sure. Yeah, sounds good. Well, thanks for having me, Pete. Um, yeah, and thanks for putting together this incredible community. I've had the pleasure of being here for, I don't even know how many years now, but but a lot. I'm always impressed. A million. A million, yeah. A million. Totally. <laughs> it feels like it some days, but uh, no, know, just right? the, the attitude of the community is amazing, right? Contributing uh, both personally and professionally, uh, job searches, and then answering questions for one another. So yeah, hopefully we can help contribute back a little bit today. Um, but yeah, my background, I mean, you're a tough act to follow, Pete, but um, I came from a little bit of a non-traditional route of getting into kind of sales leadership and running this business. But oh. I started doing um, software engineering in school and then spent most of my career in product management, where yep. uh, I found myself at Traction on Demand building products where I ended up having to uh, sell a lot of those products myself for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. And the funny part was I had no sales background whatsoever. Mm -hmm. The only formal sales experience I had was uh, serving tables at a restaurant like 20 years ago. But um, yeah, it went pretty well. <laughs> and we were able to grow uh, the business and then hire some sales folks. And back in March, we actually sold off the consulting side, Traction on Demand, mm -hmm. 
to Salesforce <laughs> themselves. And so we spun out Traction Complete formally. And just this week, actually, we raised our first funding round. We did a Series A, and um, congrats for the business. Yeah, thank you. Wow, that's exciting. Traction on Demand was doing um, uh, Salesforce Salesforce Consulting. Is that consulting exactly? It yeah, it was the the world's largest solely dedicated Salesforce consulting company. So it wasn't doing consulting on any no other platforms or anything. And yeah, um, had a great great exit to Salesforce. That's all, and that's awesome. And and then now, and so Traction and Complete obviously does. I mean, I'm familiar with Traction and Complete from a um, from an account hierarchy and kind of like a you know kind of account cleaning standpoint. But what else does Traction Complete um, work on? Yeah, it's funny. I think we're like on a similar mission to Atrium, but in a different vein, where Atrium okay. is focused more on like the sales data itself and coaching sales reps. Mm -hmm. um, but but on the same vein, we're we believe that data is this incredible instruction set for businesses, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. But as everyone on the call probably knows that the data in your Salesforce environment can become a mess and that causes mm -hmm. sort of reporting and True. dealing with your already complicated sales territory. So we were on this mission to help improve the data quality in Salesforce and, and not just the quality, but like the visibility and the actionability of that data mm -hmm. uh, so that everyone can help uh, make better data-driven decisions and allow your sales teams to be more efficient and effective. And that's why I, I love hearing you talk about Atrium and the... Um, the mission you guys are on because it's it's kind of the same thing just a different different realm but we have uh three different apps now so we're building automation software for rev ops folks so for sales okay. operations and marketing ops and at dreamforce we just announced our third one so a uh, complete clean which is a data dedupe tool oh. uh, helping, yeah helping companies clean up their data um contacts accounts leads that sort of thing but that is right. such like that is such a pain in the ass. Like, irrespective of how, like, all the different kind of like validations you try to put in place, like, people will just always figure out a way of like creating dupes. And like, Salesforce is just like miserable at detecting them. It's like terrible. That's <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> totally. No, you're exactly right. Um, yeah, and and the reason we got there is you're right. We have two uh, existing applications. So complete hierarchies. It helps automate um, linking accounts together that are part of a bigger business. Mm -hmm. So helping in a territory planning and a go-to-market standpoint, where if you want someone owning your strategic reps, owning the entire family tree, that they can see all of the accounts that are part of it. And you're making sure you're not stepping on each other's toes and whatnot. And then complete leads was the second one where it's helping automate a lot of the assignment. And so it's matching leads to not just accounts, right. but hierarchies as well and mm -hmm. using that fuzzy match algorithm and then have this huge rules engine to really facilitate your your territories your go to market so you can assign accounts contacts opportunities leads that sort of thing get them to the right people so that you can action on them a lot quicker and you're not stepping mm -hmm. on each other's toes so yeah that, that's kind of what we've been doing and that's how we're driving towards that mission of improving that that data quality visibility Right. Like there's always another data problem to be contended with and they're like, you know, and the associated like person whose ox is being gored. Well, I, I imagine you probably sold um, uh, traction complete yourself a little bit before uh, before hiring, hiring some reps. So, you know, how do you think that your sales approach has been influenced by your product management background? I know like my before I was a seller you know, a decade ago, I think the way I would kind of say that like my, uh, my selling experience or like my selling approach was influenced by that was like, uh, maybe being like more bashful than I should have been. Right. And like, <laughs> and, and not necessarily being as like, you know, out in your face. Um, hopefully yours, uh, your product management background hasn't, uh, you know, had more positive impacts and I eventually surmounted that obviously, but how, how has that impacted, um, you know, how, uh, you know, your, how you guys sell? Yeah, no, it's amazing that we have, uh, somewhat similar backgrounds and I'd say the exact same. I definitely come in with that kind of sale, typical sales personality, but I think it landed in a good way. I think, you know, when you're designing products, you're focusing on who you're solving the problems for and then what are the problems yep. that you're solving. So your personas. And if you've yep. done a good job, you're you're really trying to identify, well, um, what is that profile? What is that role? Who's that person you're solving it for? And then what are the what are they struggling with? And 
then of course designing a solution for that. And so it's almost like the inverse of a yeah. of a sales process where right. you know you're you're going through that discovery and sales process. You're asking what the problems are, and and ideally there's an overlap with the problems that you're yep. solving. And if there is, and it's a great fit, and you kind of prescribe what you've done. And I think it worked well in the sense that one, I designed it so I was passionate about it, and that probably came across. Mm. But that also it wasn't about throwing spaghetti at the wall and talking about kind of every single button and feature that was there. It was more about, hey, what are the problems? And this is why we built these features that are relevant to that. And so I I try and take that same approach uh, and coach that to my team now so yep. instead of just you know verbally going through everything focus on the problem yeah 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 like the uh the the worst possible situation is the like the harbor cruise like demo <laughs> like oh, over here on the left you have uh you know the bay bridge over here on the right we have uh alcatraz versus you know yeah so tell me like what you're looking to get out of san francisco oh well, you know me and my wife are really interested in like you know, hitting up some great restaurants. All right, well, like screw all that other stuff. Let's talk about North Beach, right? As as an example. And I think that like- I love that sure example. That you're, you're fo- yeah, like making sure that you're focusing in on the things that really matter for folks. And also like, I mean, really effective discovery isn't just about like asking questions about the things that they might be aware of or might not be aware of, um, but also is like provoking people to think about things that they might not otherwise think about. Like, so David, I, you know, are you traveling to San Francisco by yourself? No, I brought my wife. Oh, well, I imagine that she's, you know, probably not the most excited about the fact that you're spending all day long at Dreamforce. I imagine that like, you know, doing some restaurants probably seems like something that would be useful. Is that a... Uh, is that fair or if I'm left, I'm, am I off in left field? Oh no, you're right, right? And then we hone in on on the like the relevant uh, the relevant feature in 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 question. Um, totally. Yeah, I like that. I like the, like the idea of it kind of being like inverse to to product management. Um, so I think like we're we're here in November, which I can't believe, um, which means that like territory planning is probably really top of mind for a lot of folks right now. Um, Obviously, you guys work a lot with organizations to help them do a better job of territory planning, especially like large organizations that are like organizations that sell into the enterprise and have lots of, um, you know, have have lots of those hierarchy needs. And so you want to make sure that you're apportioning things correctly and so on and so forth. So, you know, how do you suggest that folks go about the process of, of territory planning as they're thinking about that for for the new year? Yeah, good question. And you're exactly right. Because I think most companies either follow the calendar year or mm-hmm. sales forces fiscal year. We're seeing more and more yeah. of these days. It's kind of amazing, actually, how, how much of a gravitational pull Salesforce has had on the whole ecosystem. Um, I know, right? It's like not just the sales world, but also yeah. like SaaS in general, where it's like, like okay, we're going to align our fiscal year to this guy's fiscal year. Yeah, it's kind of bananas. Isn't it? Well, yeah. But anyway, I mean, it's it's line up fairly well because whether you're December or sorry, January or February start, everyone's kind of starting now to put together those territories for next year. And yeah, you're exactly right. A lot of our customers that are using hierarchies, particularly, and then leads, are using it as part of their territory planning and their go-to-market. So what we've seen, and I think DocuSign is probably the best example, is that when you're going through that territory planning, it really becomes an exercise of cleaning up your data and then carving your territories. Because if you don't do the first step, your carving of territory just runs into disputes all the time. So that that cleanup of data, uh, DocuSign says they spend 50% of the whole territory exercise on the data cleanup first so that they're preempting really? problems later. Mm. And it's really, it really falls into three things. Every company, when they're carving territories, has um, a segmentation of some sort, whether it's size mm. of business, annual revenue number of employees, whether it's geography, whether it's industry, doesn't matter, some sort of segmentation. And so they first want to make sure that they're enriching all their records from a data provider so that they have everything clean and in the sand to say whether it's 500 employees and up or it's um, the telco industry, whatever it may be, that they have that data there so they can start carving. And then second step they do is to start linking accounts into a hierarchy because where they found that their biggest struggle was was when you start carving territories and haven't done that, you end up mm-hmm. getting these territory disputes and conflicts. Mm-hmm. 
And then lastly, it's to clean up any duplicates because when you're trying to make even territories, you're usually using, you, you score the territory and that's based on the number of accounts in the territory, the number yep. of opportunities, the dollars, the number of leads that came in from there, those sorts of things. And dupes can throw everything off because mm. now all of a sudden you're double counting everything or, or you may be. And so then once you go and clean that up, now your reps are pissed because they have fewer accounts than others do, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah, it kind of falls into those three. And then of course you go into the, the, um, the territory planning itself and the scoring of those territories based on how many you need. If you're growing, if you're shrinking, this is an interesting time of year, I think, right? With the economy mm. that I think usually people are planning on adding 200 more sales reps. And right now it might be the opposite, but mm. regardless of what that is, kind of carving out their territories that way. What, one of the things that um, it's funny, like the concept of a territory that is actually like, like physical mm -hmm. um, is like, kind of a, a little bit of like a legacy concept because like back in the day sales reps would walk around and like knock on doors or they would you know walk down main street and what have you and so now a lot of us a lot of sales still happens that way which is great um a lot of us sell over like zoom um or you know fill in your your uh your weapon of choice there and um and so it's less about like, like an actual like physical territory and it's more about like a set of work to be done Right, like a like a basket of of things to like you know to shoot at or 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 what have you, and so the the interesting thing there that I think a lot of a lot of organizations kind of get tripped up on is understanding like how much actual opportunity is in that like basket that we're giving folks because not all accounts are created equal, right? And, and you can do like more basic things like firmograph. You can say, oh, okay, cool. We're going to give you this many accounts and that have this many humans in it or, you know, in each of them or what have you. But like, that's not always correlated to um, like the amount of opportunity in each of those accounts, right? And of course, then like a territory is the roll up of those, those things. Um, have you seen, like, how do you recommend folks do a good job of like, leveling appropriately for the amount of actual opportunity that's in a given like bundle of, uh, of, of accounts that you're giving somebody? Um, or like, you know, how have you seen organizations be thoughtful about, about making sure that people are like leveled appropriately in that regard? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the big exercise, right? Is trying to to do mm -hmm. evenness across those yeah, yeah, territories. But it is a good point. It is very legacy, isn't it? Yeah. Like the idea of space. Um, I haven't seen so much people trying to use, I think what you're getting at was like capacity almost of the reps, because mm -hmm. usually what happens is you have a number of reps that's either growing or shrinking, and then you mm -hmm. have your addressable market that you're going after, whether it's North America, it's worldwide at this point versus trying to see like you have too much capacity in this area and so we're not even going to bother touching that next area i haven't seen that quite mm -hmm. as much but the evenness for sure is the big exercise and it's something yeah. that everyone's trying to focus on because otherwise you just get complaints right that your reps just come whining. it's so funny that like that's why i know i was literally just thinking about the verb wine it's like yeah. so funny that um like yeah, that that's the thing that like so much that like you're trying to avoid, and like it just kind of it kind of is what it is. Like you know, like the the amount of like brain damage associated with that like leads to a lot of this. Even though like that's probably from a business impact standpoint, like territory collisions probably like don't ultimately like do they ultimately ultimately matter given the fact that like you know you have a twenty percent win rate or or what have you. But like my goodness, from a from a human morale standpoint, and like you know gnashing of teeth and like you know uh pulling of hair standpoint like yeah but anyway yeah. so evenness and so how do, so how do we avoid this by making it even totally well and i agree i mean and and even just the time spent by everyone involved having the brain oh God, capacity so much brain focused damage. on right it's so dumb. <laughs> yeah it's so inefficient and and you're right it's ridiculous because at the end of the day it probably won't have that much impact but it ends up because of all the emotions right False yeah exactly off. But yeah, how do they get the evenness? Yeah, it's scoring. It's really scoring. So once that data is cleaned up, it's mm -hmm. trying to find um, 
and and you're usually using the accounts, the history that you have, because where we see problems with people falling into the trap of is like, well, we've never, there's so much greenfield in Ohio we've never tapped into. And it's like, well, mm -hmm. there's probably a reason for that, right? Like, <laughs> don't go give someone Ohio. You want to try and uh, give everyone a little bit of it so you can actually get some wins there. Yeah, test it out, right? Yeah. But so where we've seen the best is using their existing history and carving that up. Mm -hmm. And if they have a higher proportion in areas like the Bay Area, then double down on that. Carve them into much smaller territories. Ignore oh, totally. the point. Ignore the yeah. geography region and focus on the number of accounts, the number of opportunities you have, the dollars closed, that sort of thing. And that's always been the way. And we're starting to see uh, new trends too that are breaking the mold of like a um, geography, a neighborhood, a zip code, that kind of thing, where people yeah. are doing like alphanumeric splits where it's- Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, so trying to do- You get more. A, B, C, D, you get E, F, G. Yeah. Exactly. Which seems to be a lot more appropriate these days when you're selling over Zoom anyway. Yeah, for sure. I think the thing that I oftentimes recommend to folks is um, like hone in on what like the unit of demand is in the organiz in the organization that you're selling to. So I'll, I'll like give two examples. So it, with Atrium, like the unit of utility for for Atrium, because like we make data driven sales management software, it helps managers you know better manage and and uh, improve rep performance like the the utility of a, an, an account to us is based on like how many sellers they have like at, like when people ask me like what's your ideal customer profile we're like I, my quick answer is kind of like oh sdr plus ae has to be greater than or equal to 10 right but if you think about like if you're trying to apportion a territory you would say you would want to have the number of sales reps on each account right because you know 10 accounts that have 10 sales reps in it, uh, in each of them is a little bit different than 10 accounts that have 50 sales reps in them, right? Um, and so making sure that you know what that unit of, of like demand would be, or kind of like unit of value, the like kind of like the linearly associated unit of value um, is, is a really powerful thing. And like, you should know this anyway from a prospecting standpoint, because if you're working with a data provider, like I know that you guys do a lot of work with like Zoom info and, and what have you, like be, being able to say, hey, let's like find a couple thousand or, or what have you really great accounts is gonna be predicated on knowing what those signifiers of demand are. And then making sure that that's present in your CRM data model in some sort of capacity is is very powerful because like otherwise if you just if you if you just are doing humans in the organization or you know amount of funding raised or any those sort of things you're gonna end up with like potentially non-leveled um, accounts which is like really problematic um, it's not nearly as problem I actually screwed this up at Talentbin uh, it's not nearly as problematic as um, Talentbin was my last software company um, it's not nearly as problematic as like giving the entire San Francisco Bay Area to like one rep as an example. And then they're just like, yeah. like you know, getting completely <laughs> overlooked, which is of course dumb, on, dumb in itself because you want that spread across lots of folks so it's that no one's overloaded, right? And you're servicing that demand or like appropriately tackling that demand in the, in the market. So that would be kind of like my big thing would, would be figure out what your like unit of demand is and then make sure that that's present in your CRM data model such that then you can like level appropriate. I imagine you guys have probably seen organizations do that where like they try to be smart about like the signifier of potential demand in the organization. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and then alternatives too, where if they're doing a channel sales model versus a direct, oh sure, they're looking at that kind of capacity through their partner and how many accounts uh, each oh, yeah. partner is holding and or, or rep is holding yeah yeah it those ones you're right they're more effective and they can give more capacity based planning the data is harder to surface so it seems like yeah like you got to do more work you, you usually have to out. take it in from some some third party system or like an offshore yeah offshore approach or something for yeah. sure yeah or proprietary figuring that out yourself and doing the work yeah partner teams yeah. But sometimes you can get like a proxy, which can be okay. Like I remember uh, a buddy of mine was the CRO at Clearbit and one of the indicate, like they, like ultimately at the time, 
like the amount of ad spend was really helpful for them to oh, understand because yeah. this is when they were like doing ABM stuff. But then they just realized that like it was a pretty good proxy to just use um, the um, what is it called the Alexa rank the Amazon. Oh. Like, this is back, this is this is back before Alexa was you know a, a digital assistant or, or right, whatever yeah, in, your, in, in, your, in your kitchen. Amazon, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. But it was like the Alexa rank, yeah. Yeah. and so like they just had that loaded in on every single. Um, on every single account that was in their in their CRM, nice. and so when they were doing apportionment, they were just like, okay, you're gonna have this many accounts that are, you know, in this rank. You're gonna have this many accounts that are in this rank, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so okay, so we're talking about how like you know how to do a better job of territory um, apportionment and like kind of equality, um, where I imagine that people do like you know have a lot of have a lot of boo boos. Um, I imagine that there's other um, big kind of like sales ops boo-boos that you've uh you you've seen there what what it's like your biggest uh sales ops um and like seller kind of boo-boo that you've seen <laughs> when you've uh when when you've been working with all your customers i'm ideally let's like you know let's let's keep it anonymous so we don't like spill the beans on anyone sure yeah drop names yeah uh boo-boos i would say the the worst kind of horror story we probably have heard of is is one of our customers um, had a sales rep that was doing a great job working an opportunity through the funnel and got to the one yard line when they found out that the account that this was for fell into someone else's territory because it was a subsidiary of someone else's account of, of uh, headquarters. Mm -hmm. And according to their territory rules, it meant that the entire commission went to the owner of the headquarters. Oh, and, fun. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, this guy ended up with the whole commission, this poor woman who'd done all the work and done her job really appropriately because she had no idea this account was not part of her territory, uh, lost out and she ended up quitting. So they lost a great, oh. rep, obviously successful because they weren't willing to kind of change their, their territory rules or they hadn't planned appropriately. And so that was probably the biggest one and, and one that uh, sticks with us when we're we're trying to help companies avoid those kinds of disputes and, and conflicts. Yeah, I feel that like, so the, probably the, the best way of dealing with that is to just like make sure that your, <laughs> like your, ter your, your account data isn't hosed and, uh, and like you're being thoughtful about this stuff. But like just from a tactical standpoint, because we all make, like we all screw things up all the time, right? Like, you know, but me multiple times a day. Um, <laughs> gosh, I feel like in a situation like that, um, like the like the company really should just I mean just double pay on it yeah or be because... flexible have a policy in place where there's you know get past a certain <clears throat> threshold of a deal that you get to keep it or because you also don't want to interrupt the customer the customer doesn't want to switch mid cycle to a new rep right? oh, yeah. yeah I agree totally and and also yeah. like yeah in the case of the other rep too like it's not like there was an open opportunity on that account. No. Right. Yeah. And like, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't being worked or, or what have you. So it's almost, yeah, there, I, I feel that this is something that like startups, this, this is probably a fairly large organization. I would imagine yeah. where this, yeah. where this happened yeah. is like one of the things that we talk about with my, my team all the time is just like, you know, be flexible and think about like the opportunity costs associated with like, you know, um, trying to solve a problem or like, you know, trying to create like some specific process versus like, we had this recently, right? Where um, some account executive had created an opportunity. Um, like there was some sort of like collision that had happened. There was like a race condition where like the, the account executive created an opportunity. There was an SDR who was working in inbound lead and like he created an opportunity to happen like right around the same time. And, you know, and then people were kind of like, you know, snippy at each other, like, you know, oh, like I self-sourced this and da, da 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 And it was just like, oh my goodness, guys, like we're talking about like, you know, we're talking about like 50 bucks worth of like commission here. Jeez Louise. <laughs> Obviously like yeah. magnitude, yeah. like a little bit of a like difference of magnitude. But I was like, guys, we've literally spent like five times as much um, like salary expense talking about this as just like you get an Amazon gift card and you get an Amazon gift card, right? Like, totally. come on, like, let's, let's move on. Um, yeah. yeah funny. Agree. What, Matt, um, aside Matt, from, Oh, sorry, go, ahead. go ahead. Oh yeah. Uh, Matt West is a, a friend of ours and a customer of ours at Capato. He, uh, he's done a great job over there about kind of creating policies where mm. there's also the rules of engagement and the data and the software and whatnot, but the policies are around, Hey, 
there are going to be territory conflicts. They're going when, to happen. When, when things get weird, like yeah, it's going to happen. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And let's all agree before you get your territory. And that's what he said is the key is before you get the territory, agree to it. So you can't go complain afterwards on how we're going to handle these kind of disputes in the future when it's an edge case that we haven't thought of kind of thing, which is a great, great way to go about it. You guys work with Copato. Those guys make cool software. That's fun. Another yeah, uh, yeah, Salesforce awesome. ecosystem. Um, Okay, so that was like a good territory planning um, or like territory rules of engagement horror story. Um, what other kind of like more general horror stories have you seen with, uh, you know, in, in your customers around kind of like sales sales efficiency or sales excellence or whatever? One that we hear uh, an incredible number of times, which always shocks me, is a pricing issue where mm. sales reps will be offering up, you know, they, and I think it's just natural at the end of the quarter, you get a little bit desperate if you're trying to close deals. And so you offer up some crazy discount, but where it always comes back to bite companies is when it happens to be part of an organization that already has like preferred pricing or established pricing. And they go mm -hmm. through a centralized procurement team and the procurement uh -huh. team picks up on it, that they're getting offered some 40% discount at the end of the quarter. And all of a sudden they want that for all of their pricing for, you know, their enterprise level deals. And oh. it's, Oh, that's it's, interesting. Like it would like go, Oh, wow. That's like a, it's, that's, it's like an account hierarchy. It's like the implications of account hierarchies on like preferential pricing. Yeah, like exactly. you're trying to like get this thing across the line here. It goes up to here. It goes up the hierarchy. Yeah. And then they're like, wait a minute, but you do business here, here, here. Oh man. That's like, that's like double black diamond same. skiing. Wow. Yeah. And it's, it's crazy how often we hear about it. Um, wow. And it can have huge implications, right? It either pisses off the customer kind of at best, or you end up having to discount like crazy off other stuff too. And that actually loses like, revenue. Yeah. Oh my God. It's like you close this deal. <laughs> Great. I closed some net new ARR and then like churned a bunch. Yeah, of, exactly. Of, but, like but across your, all these other deals. your territory over there, you get to churn a whole bunch. Yeah. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. Yeah. It's Man. shocking. But um yeah, and it's all stuff that's avoidable. But the, uh, how about you? You probably see stuff all the time as well. Um, I think probably the biggest, I mean, the biggest errors that we see from a data-driven sales management standpoint is really around um, <clears throat> probably like managers being unwilling to um, to like engage with like metrics and data in order to like to use it to measure and manage their teams. Um, it's like less and less the case because like, you know, the younger guard is more attuned to that. But, you know, you get folks who have kind of been around the block um, and maybe they came up in an environment before there was like good data availability and what have you. And so, although we are kind of seeing things turning somewhat where we're like, you know, we see these, um, you know, these 50 something, um, you know, uh, VPs of sales or what have you, who are like, yeah, you know, previously we never had, um, you know, we never had the level of data granularity that we have now. So I never really kind of like built that muscle, if you will, but instead of them, kind of being like poo-pooing it, kind of like the the scouts in like Moneyball or whatever, like, oh, I don't know, Billy Bean. Like we can't, <laughs> you can't measure, you can't measure baseball players. And so they're like, man, I kind of get this. And I think it's what's kind of helpful. We do a lot of like master classes around this, around like, you know, Moneyball, but like, because a lot of people are like sports fans, right? So it's like, hey, like you can use metrics to measure and improve um, the performance of like a baseball team or a basketball team or whatever the players within that, or like, you know, your golf game or what have you. So that kind of like helps people get that a little, little bit better. Um, nice. Another question that was um, kind of asked ahead of time, and I think you guys probably end up seeing this a lot, um, is, you know, when companies acquire other companies and then have to integrate their, um, their CRM, you know, what sort of amount of time does it take to, you know, for an acquiring company to integrate the, uh, the comp like that, that acquired CRM into their, uh, into their kind of core CRM instance? Oh, man. Oh, uh, yeah, we do, particularly when Attraction on Demand and all the consulting, we did a oh, bunch of you guys of probably courses. did about a bunch. We did, yeah. Did in fact, this. we did oh, some man. for Salesforce themselves, like when they bought uh, Data.com, when they oh, bought uh, no Exact Target. Yeah, we did all those org managers, but it, it totally depends. Um, the exercise really becomes uh, about the data and then the, the functionality in the org. But if you just look mm -hmm. at the data side, um, 
you want to integrate it because the whole premise, I think, of buying a company is that you see efficiencies and being able to kind of cross sell amongst the two different customer bases, not not to mention uh-huh. you know, the, the overlapping staff. But um, and so what you need to be able to do is to make sure that when you bring the data in, it's very clear to all of your reps where the opportunities are to cross sell. And the worst thing to do is when people just dump all the data in together, it creates a whole bunch of dupes oh, man. and it's a mess. So oh, when man. you go through it properly, what people usually do is they'll they'll use an external data provider like a Dun & Bradstreet or someone that has that unique Dun's number to try mm-hmm. and map sure. the accounts to accounts. And so when you bring them in and merge them, now you can get a clear understanding of where those opportunities are. And that usually takes... Um, I would say it's probably about a three month exercise, but it really depends on the amount of data. If you wow. have millions and millions of records versus if you had 5,000 records, 5,000 records, you could do very, very quickly. It's when you're at millions of records, yeah. it becomes a problem. But there's all sorts of, like there's these private equity firms. That's what they do all the time. They're buying companies all the time and they've operationalized it, right? They can, they can get that in quickly and still probably a three month exercise, but it's like, that's from acquisition to bringing the orgs together, having all the conversations dumping the data in i would say realistically from time of acquisition to done what we usually saw was probably around a year but it wasn't because it took that long it was that you know you let the orgs run independently for a while decide what to do with the staff and then then you kind of get to operationalize i don't know hopefully that answers the question yeah yeah for sure i think the interesting thing about like cross sell and um and uh, in in situations like that is really fascinating. It's like, you don't want to dupe the accounts, but we want to get the historical closed one ops onto the new accounts. But we probably, like while we're doing that, we probably want to create some sort of like new signifier on like the ops coming in from the acquired company to like, tag them as like, oh, this is a data.com close one op or a Slack close one op, or I'm just thinking about Salesforce acquisitions or a troops close one op or what have you, such that then like the, the you can run the relevant queries in order to say, hey, um, here's all of like use Slack as an example, pretty, you know, a lot of, a lot of customers there. Um, like show me all the the customers show me all the accounts that use that use slack that you know maybe don't have a um you know maybe don't have a marketing automation like we haven't talked with from about marketing automation as an example right exactly Yeah. yeah no no you're exactly right and that's the exercise right that's what you're trying to get out of buying the company and so i think it speaks a lot to like the the land and expand or cross sell upsell and Mm -hmm. wanting to be able to surface Things like uh, what products have been sold. I think that's kind of what you're getting at, like Slack been sold versus Troops versus Sales Cloud, Marketing Cloud, that kind of thing. Because if you can make that very visible to all your reps, you're almost giving them like a map of where to go next, right? If you've landed Mm -hmm. with Slack, well, now you can cross sell Marketing Cloud. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, but that we know sales reps don't tend to be great at kind of hunting around for that kind of thing. So you kind of have to make no, it. Friends. You want to surface it. Yeah. You gotta, <laughs> yeah. You gotta, you gotta tag it and like create an activity for them or send them an email alert or something. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But if you can do that, if you go through that mm-hmm. exercise, yeah, they can be incredibly effective because they know exactly what to cross up because they're hungry. They want to sell more and they're incented to do it. So if you can make it apparent, yeah, things will usually go really well. What, um, so wh- you guys have a number of customers. What um, kind of like trend have you been seeing in um, in your customers that are working for them in, in terms of things that company, the people should be thinking about investing in more from a sales motion standpoint? Well, I mean, the biggest trend right now, I, I don't know if you agree, but is the economy, right? And mm-hmm. things are, are turning, there's layoffs, there's people cutting budget. So deals are ended up pushing and or or canceling kind of thing Mm -hmm. and so what we're seeing as a reaction to that i think is probably what you're getting at is um Mm -hmm. a a driver back to and it's hilarious it's like groundhog day from when covid Mm -hmm. hit and companies went into this protectionist mode uh companies now going back to trying to sell more into their existing customers and it's it's hilarious it ties into your last question um 
where now they they've built up that trust. Yeah. They've proven a return on investment. They're already in as a vendor because if procurement is now talking to, uh, told to cut spend, it's tougher to get a net new logo in there. Um, but selling it to an existing customer is a little easier, right? Because they're already through a lot of those hurdles. They have some trust and they can usually coincide it with like a renewal and, yeah. and get it through. So that we're seeing a huge spike there. And, and it's exactly the exact same thing we were just talking about and trying to facilitate that. It's surfacing the data. And where are those areas? Is it that you have a small footprint of licenses today and yeah. you can sell more into the, the bigger team? Or is it that you've sold one product and now you can sell others? Or is it you've sold in one department or one business and able to sell into another department or another subsidiary kind of thing. Which I think a lot of that is, it really hinges on having your data tight. So um, so we actually have a pretty good like land and expand motion where like one of the things that's kind of neat about Atrium is it takes like five minutes to set up an account. Um, so typically what we'll do is we'll enter through a sales manager or an SDR manager, or like a sales leader or an SDR leader, sometimes sometimes through sales operations as, as well. It's usually about like 50-50 there. Okay. Um, but like we can transact with like, you know, the SDR part of an organization as an example, right? And, um, and but then what we'll want to do is like go to the other parts of the mm. organization as, as well. Um, and so what you want to, you know, but like at this point, because we have like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of customers being able to interrogate that and say, hey, this is how much Atrium this account has purchased. Also, here's how much Atrium they could purchase because yeah, nice. they're only, you know, they only have like three seats or whatever. And there's like eight managers in the organization. Um, to be honest, like we don't actually have that modeled well. Don't, don't. Don't uh, don't tell my RevOps people who don't exist. Um, but I, I you can but like it, it's it's related to that thing we were talking about previously yeah, about exactly. making sure that you have like the total amount of demand in the account modeled Potential. such that yeah. yeah exactly such that you can then contrast that and then I guess it's all just like asking the same like asking similar questions where it's it's like um, you know how many products are into this organization right now how um so like in the first case it's 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 a question of modeling how much demand is in the account and then having you know and then maybe having some sort of field on the account that like rolls up how much like is actually being consumed and then being able to do a delta on that and report on it what um like what are the effective ways of, of like querying to see um you know where there are product gaps in in organizations because like doing that manually from a account planning standpoint is like Yes, people should be doing it, but mm. exactly so being exactly. able to yeah. do the like being able to report on it is obviously way more effective, right? This is like why we totally. use databases. How do you, how do you recommend folks do that? It's so easy to say, well, we have account managers, we have customer success, we have sales reps, and they're talking to these guys. They could just enter it in, but it doesn't happen. No, yeah. no way. Yeah, and it gets complicated, and but it's super effective. So you're right that uh, everyone's data is different. How they've entered into Salesforce, are they using products? Are they using opportunity products? Um, are they subscription-based, right? So do you capture that mm -hmm. renewal when that renewal comes up or does it mm -hmm. churn kind of thing? So based on all that, you can set up or, or what we help our customers set up is um, indicators. So basically graphical icons that show mm -hmm. the products that have been sold or whether you have an open opportunity or renewal coming up. So that hmm. at a glance, you can very quickly see either through your territory or if it's a hierarchy to be able to see, okay, here are the products that have been sold and here's the ones that haven't. So that kind of gray space, if you will. And the best thing you can do is automate it so that it'll capture things like the renewal or not so that it turns on and off. Cause the last thing you want is like, Oh, they're a customer, but it turns out they were a customer six years ago. No, they haven't been no. a customer for years. Right. And so you're skipping over that. Uh, yeah, yeah, so to be able to automate that and to be monitoring for those things. And it really comes down to the data and how it's entered in Salesforce. But using what we do is use our kind of rules engine through complete mm -hmm. to kind of monitor that and set it up to customize it because it's super powerful. Once you once you set it up, it becomes that map and it's reportable. So there's the graphical view for the rep eyeballing it, but then there's a reportable side. So you can run a report, say, in your territory. Is, 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 it, is it on the account object or is this like a, just like a separate UI? rolled up onto the account object yeah so the, the data so is, is there just is there like a is there like a traction complete like widget like in the 
in the in the like in the canvas right there and like you can just kind of like look at that and like yeah exactly and the... it's actually into a field so you can put it wherever so obviously it's in our widget but that you can put it wherever you'd like and then you can report it you can put it in list views you can put it on reports that kind of thing but so that it's uh wherever you need it because that's the thing that we talk to our our, our uh, customers about is that you can say this is where it should be but what you really need to do is put it wherever the rep is going to see it yeah right wherever which they're going to be which is ideally like lots of different places exactly so like in, the in the ui like yeah, yeah in the like ui in, in the in yeah. the opportunity as a formula field looking at the field that's on the account in yeah. an email right on the email alert that gets fired out you know exactly. via a, mer a merge field yeah having it as a field is um having it as a field is like really like you know firing it out via troops into slack et, et cetera et cetera like yeah. i can see that being really really helpful. Um, kind of continue on the land and expand um, topic. Um, you know, what should folks really be kind of like looking for when they want to double down on selling more to their existing customers? Obviously, we talked about like, you know, that gray space analysis and what have you, but like, what are other things that they should be thinking about to, to make that more effective? Yeah, I, I mean, we talked about a lot of it, but so I think we were focused more on that gray space, like you've sold some, but not all. Yeah. The next step is really that white space. So where is the opportunity that you haven't even touched yet? And a lot of that mm -hmm. comes down to either a department you haven't touched yet mm -hmm. or a business. So part of a hierarchy and, and surfacing that as well to again, give them that mm -hmm. map because reps, I think are really good notoriously, right? Everyone's different, but notoriously sales reps are really good at relationships and ask making asks of the customer. Hey, That's who else should I do. talk to? Right. Yeah. But unless they're aware that there might be a totally different business unit that their primary point of contact might not know about, they're never going to ask and they're not going to know to ask. But if you can surface up things, uh, the one example I love is Verizon's this massive organization. Oh, I can only right? imagine. And But they own a company like Blue Jeans. Blue Jeans is a competitor to Zoom. Very different business, runs pretty much independently. And so you can imagine that if you're a rep talking to ops or whomever at Verizon, they might at not Verizon. have Blue who blue jeans is well, who else should i who else should i be talking to i don't know i think you're talking to everyone versus hey do you know anyone at blue jeans exactly exactly or who would know people at blue jeans how would i get in touch with that sure. kind of thing or can i use you as a reference or whatever because if you can give them if you can arm them with that it's like a little bit of a just like yeah, a little breadcrumb yeah Exactly. And don't make them dig for it. But if you can arm them with it, they're really good. Sales reps notoriously are fantastic, right? Because they're incented to to chase that breadcrumb. Yeah, yeah I, I, I like that. I think um, some of the other things from a land and expand standpoint that I think can be really effective is if you can. Um, so we're talking about like having good data. I think the other thing is like like having good dynamic data as well, because organizations are in flux. Um, so some examples around this would be, um, we actually use some software <clears throat> that monitors the accounts that like our customers of ours, um, and look for new people who are showing up in those accounts. So like, as an example for us, if a new, if there's a new sales manager or a new, uh, sales, like, you know, SDR leader or like a new CRO or a new head of sales operations, it's, and like, it's incumbent on that CSM and they, we have a count team. So like AE, CSM kind of partnered together, it's incumbent on those guys to, to tackle that new person coming in, um, a, because there's a potential upsell opportunity there. Like, we don't want to wait for them mm -hmm. to, like raise their hand, like, you know, they will eventually perhaps, but like, why wait? <laughs> right. Let's like go say hi. Um, let's congratulate them. Let's send them a bottle of champagne, those sort of things. Um, and then let's see if they want a, uh, an incremental atrium seat. Um, but then also, so like that, I think there's that, then there's the other piece, which is also for like following your champions. Um, we actually, uh, I'm a big fan of this software called census that allows you to put, um, usage data, onto contact objects and like account objects as well. Essentially allows you to like take um, data from your um, from your cloud data warehouse. So like Snowflake, Redshift, et cetera, and then like do reverse ETL on it into your various tools. Like in our case, we use it with Salesforce. You can use it with marketing automation solutions as well. Point is, is that we have all of our users modeled as contact objects in, in Salesforce and you can see their usage, you know, trailing nice. 30 
um, you know, trailing 30 day um, usage. Oops. Sorry, my headset had a uh, had a restart there. Um, all those sort of things. But importantly, we have like total usage over time. So if somebody is like a very high user of Atrium, it's a usually a pretty good indicator that they're stoked on it. So we actually tag that on the contact object and the software uh, called User Gems pays attention to when that person lands somewhere else. Oh, nice. Right? Yeah, so what you can do, and then that gets routed on over to SDR, right? Where they're like, oh man, here's some champion who is a huge user of Atrium over here at blah, blah, blah. And then they just landed over here as like the new CRO, quick, go go get them. And oh, so it's, it's not like, land, it's not land and expand, but it's like, it's kind of like land and expand because you're you're selling to the same customer again. And they like, as you kind of noted earlier, like they have, you know, they have, uh, you know, they have trust. They they know that your your stuff you know your stuff works, et cetera, et cetera. I love um, that. I love that because I think we're we talk a lot internally. Like we talk a lot about hierarchies, right? Probably more than ever expected to. But <laughs> but what is a hierarchy? It's really, like cocktail. It's like how cocktail parties. Yeah, you know, David's totally. over in the corner yeah. talking, talking <laughs> like, "Hey, is your data <laughs> clean?" And like and people and people just run screaming. Yeah, but when you think about it, it's really just a collection of accounts that have influence over one another, sure. and. And that can either be implicit or explicit. And I think what you're talking about is like, yeah, these are two different accounts. There's no legal relationship whatsoever, but there's influence because of this person. And that might be instead uh, groups of accounts that are influenced by a partner, right? No mm -hmm. legal authority over one another, but they're influenced mm -hmm. by that person. It could even be things like your, your own sales territory, where it's not about the influence. It's just collection of accounts that you want to roll up the data for. You want to see the products you've sold and those that you haven't. And so that's what we've been trying to focus is kind of break the idea of, of that old legal hierarchy, although it's still really important, but be able to then adapt to this new world, right? Where it's people like are moving affinity. around. It's just a relationship, right? It's like that signifies something. Exactly. Right? Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's I love that. You that's can imagine great. like having more connections, like other than like hierarchy connections, it's like, yeah, partner connections or whatever. And it just, yeah. it's like modeled in the, in the database. Do you have people using traction complete to like model those other associations? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, particularly when they have a large go-to-market for, or through partners, right? They want, and, and sometimes it's tied on the account, but a lot of times it's on the opportunity because they might use a lot of different partners, but they'll want to know, okay, well, this opportunity was, was influenced by that partner kind of thing. And then let's see all of the business that this partner has kind of influenced because then mm. it's like, hey, what have we sold to them? What haven't we? Let's go through the partner to do that. Yeah, so we're seeing more and more of that all the time. Got it. Um, so aside from some of the like data challenges we were talking about, like what are some of the other challenges you've seen um, in your customers around like aligning like go to market teams and, um, you know, making sure that everyone's kind of like marching in the right order there and, and like how have people you know, address those? Oh, man. Um, well, usually I think the struggle that we see is that kind of uh, natural and, and perhaps positive competition between like sales and marketing, right? That it's <laughs> marketing's job is to create a whole bunch of leads and sales job is to close those, but sales gets to complain that, well, marketing gave us the, the leads you gave us were junk. And Marketing yeah. then complains that sales, you know, wasn't responding work quick them. enough kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. They're not working. They either didn't respond quick enough or they didn't put enough touches in. And of course now they're junk, but um, yeah. So the best right. way we've seen is instead of having competitive or not necessarily competitive, but disparate goals mm -hmm. uh, sure. where one is like marketing qualified leads and the other is revenue. It's like, give them one mm -hmm. combined target and they have to go figure out how they're going to do that together. Cause then they act as a team and not as competition. Yeah. And, and then beyond that, make everything super visible so that marketing can tell exactly how quickly sales reps are responding and they can see how many touches have been put in yeah. and sales can see where these leads are coming from and what their intent is and that, that sort of thing, because that's going to give everyone, um, less room for arguing, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think, yeah, the, the close, the, the more you can kind of like tie people together at the hip, the more they're going to like, they like, they have to, 
um, like work together to hit the joint goal. So rather than saying like, hey, here's this lead and like I deliver this lead and, and then, hey, you've got bookings and like those are really far apart. You can say like you can have those, but then also intermediaries as well. Like, hey, actually, you're going to be gold uh, marketing. You're going to be gold on uh, stage one opportunities nice. yeah. as well. Well, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Like, you know, AEs have to do some stuff there. Yeah, but you have influence on that too. The quality, like it's, it's, um, you know, combined responsibility and, and like, you know, similarly, um, you know, AE, like we do this with, um, use SDR and AE as an example. So like a really important part of our sales motion is organizations turning on an atrium account. Cause again, it takes like five minutes to turn one on. So our account executives typically will do a discovery call with, um, with an organization, you know, help reveal to them kind of like where there are gaps in how they're measuring and managing their, their reps. And then, so usually that person's like excited to be like, oh yeah, man, I didn't realize like, you know, how, how far behind the curve we are here. Yeah, sure. Let's like turn on an account. The SDRs are actually compensated like they're compensated on opportunity cre creation. Of course, marketing is marketing is gold on opportunity creation as, as well, but also they're compensated in gold on how many of those opportunities get to a setup account, a lit up, we call it a lit up account. Mm, um, nice. do, yeah. do, do they do they have totality of like responsibility for that? No, they have influence on it, right? And yeah. so it's, but they're not, they're not just gold on that, right? They're gold on like the leading leading indicator, the, like the next lagging indicator and the next lagging indicator. And then that's kind of where it ends. Like, are they gold on revenue? Nah, they would probably be pretty tough for them yeah. to be gold on yeah. revenue. Are they gold on like pure like pipeline that might be BS, like stage zero pipeline? Yeah, but also like stage one mm. pipeline yeah. as well, right? Where yeah, they still have like their hands on it. Qualified, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, th and then that like engenders them kind of thinking about like, man, actually like what, like what makes for really good qualified pipeline? Okay. What programs can we do that are going to attract the right people who are prone to, to progress versus like, okay, they've got a heartbeat. They've got a <laughs> smile. Like, well, let's just, let's just put them on the calendar. Right. Totally. The other I like is that marketing now helping move down the funnel. Right, and and that's where I think account-based marketing, account-based sales has had a huge influence. Where they're working together on a on a set number of accounts, trying to birth, get them on the hook, whether it's outbound and inbound, sure, and then continue to nurture them through those events and whatnot to try to get them down from stage one to stage two, kind of thing. Yeah, that's worked really yeah, well. Yeah, I think I, I think yeah, I mean it's just human nature, but the more. Um, I'm trying to think of the example, like the less it can be like Lord of the Flies with like two different teams, like red team, blue team yeah. or whatever. Um, and instead it's like, it's it's like if you have kids and they're fighting, you're like, cool, both of you have to be in the same room together, right? <laughs> and like, like we're going to handcuff you to each other, right? Like that's going to, that's yeah. going to make it such that you're going to have to like, so like handcuff them together with respect to metrics, right? So they're, they're like, they both have a collaborative, uh, collaborative KPI. And so, yeah, there's healthy competition, but then there's also like the push and pull there. And I, I've talked with my marketing team about this. Like we have marketing program managers who are like, I put together this like really killer event um, or this like really great content. And it drives a bunch of like signups or like qualified leads or whatever. And it's like, yeah, you're not like um, the like SDRs don't necessarily report into you, but you care about it. Right. So if you're aware that like maybe the SDRs aren't calling or maybe they're like they're like setting the leads down too quickly or what have you, like you've got skin in that game. So you should like you, you're not going to go and say like, hey, you need to call more SDRs, but you're going to go to the SDR manager and you're going to go to whoever that goes up to and be like, hey, we want to have more opportunities and more pipe that comes from this. I'm observing this thing right here right? and having that like healthy push and pull, which, you know, draw, like challenging um, those folks to be like to go upstream or go downstream is something that oftentimes, you know, especially junior staff will be a little bit kind of like dicey around. And so you can imagine the other direction too, like if sales is saying, Hey, look, like there's a bunch of like bad, like poorly qualified titles that are showing up on here. I'm going to go back upstream and talk with you about that. And like, maybe give you some ideas around how we can attract audience that's like more relevant. The appropriate right? ones. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, wonderful. Well, um, unfortunately, 
Um, we are out of time. So David, that was absolutely fantastic. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. I, I, as as I kind of like promised you ahead of time, uh, time would fly and it would, we would have just like a wonderful geek geek sesh. Uh, for folks who, um, um, you know, who are interested, this is what has been recorded. We're going to go ahead and put it up online. Uh, go ahead and join us next week when we have uh, Brandon Kelly, the VP of sales from Qualia, uh, former MongoDB, former Upwork uh, sales leader. So that's going to be absolutely fantastic. Um, David, great to see you and have a great rest of your week. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, Pete. Great to see you too. And yeah, if anyone had any questions for us, come visit us at tractioncomplete.com. Okay. See you, David. Bye. Thanks, Pete. Take